or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee, of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Father, tonight as we go into your word and we endeavor to find application on how that we can be not only a unified body, but an effective body, and Lord, with members that are please you. Lord, I pray that you would teach us biblical spiritual truth, we pray and ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, again, we're in that portion of 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul is, has transitioned from rebuking the church primarily about things that are wrong, but now he's beginning to answer questions that the church has, questions they've asked him, and he's answering them in a letter to help them to understand things in balance. Now, um, we last, uh, before we got into this portion of Scripture, which really will carry us through the rest of 1 Corinthians. Before we got to the portion of Scripture, the Apostle Paul had begun a section in which he said that the way that the church was doing things, the way he put it was, I praise you not. And he said the reason is that when you come together, you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Literally, because of the practices, because of the way things are going in the church, when you have convened, you're actually worse off than before you went to church. And that's tragedy, isn't it? It's tragic. Now, there's a, there's a helpful reminder to us that it is possible for us to come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Listen, it's possible for them. It's possible for us as well. Um, we, you know, it seems as though uh, there is such a cavalier, lackadaisical attitude toward worshiping God. And even a condemnation for those who would carefully worship God. Uh, I'll spell that out. I'll be very particular. Uh, most people want to worship God the way that they feel like worshiping God. Do we agree with that? In other words, in the church, when people come to church, they want to worship God their way. And, uh, man, people talk about worship. I'm hearing again. It seemed like for a while I didn't have to hear much of it, but I'm hearing it again, it seems like more and more recently, how important rock music is to worshiping God. Um, and how just, you know, hey, listen, a church is going to really be an in-touch, godly church is really worshiping. They're just going to have to have some great music performance. And uh, it troubles me to think about that because you don't find that in the Scripture anywhere. You don't find, you know, this is what we need in order to worship God. But what it really is is what they're talking about. They're saying, this is the place where people are really connecting. This is the place where people are really being reached, if you will, and connected to the churches in this area. Why is it? Well, because you're satisfying something they want. 
Now, friend, worship is not and never has been for the purpose of our meeting our needs. In other words, we all need to worship, do we not? Do we not have an innate, God-given need to worship God? Yes. But what worship is, as opposed to what uh, is called worship, are entirely different things altogether. Worship is not me uh, doing what I like and what makes me feel good. I, I like the way A.W. Tozer put it. I, I've quoted this many times over the years, and I think it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate statement. A.W. Tozer, he said, he said, we cannot worship. He said, we can, um, we can, uh, what is, oh man, now I'm going to mess it all up. He said, we can adore something and not worship it. We cannot worship something and not adore it. He said, we, or, we can admire something and not worship it. But we cannot worship that which we do not admire. And he talked about admiration and the important part of really looking at God and saying, God, you are uh, and for lack of, I mean, the word is a good word, but it's been so misused that it seems not to have the sense it had. But God, you're so awesome. You are so different, so holy, so characteristically opposite of what we are. And you are so uh, just magnificent. And so we could, we could admire something or someone and not worship them, but we cannot worship somebody and not admire them. And worship, a large part of worship is admiration, admiring God, or looking. You cannot lift up Jesus Christ without admiring Him, without just being amazed at the fact that in spite of who we are, that God has reached out in love and mercy to us with His perfect Son, who had no reason in and of Himself, had no personal need to die on the cross for us, but yet because of His love, chose being the sinless, perfect sacrifice to offer Himself, willingly lay down His life for us, and uh, to, to look at the love of God and just be amazed by it, and, and overall, if you will, by it is an important part of worship. When we talk about uh, when in our worship service we want to lift up Jesus Christ, man, we want to praise Jesus. We want to talk about there is none greater than God. There is none like God. There's no comparison to God. He's out in a way, in every way that we are better. Uh, and better just seems like, mm, you know, like you, you just, you can't describe how different from us God is in a better way. And God is always merciful. God is always loving. God is always kind. God is always right. He's always holy. He's always consistent. He's unchanging. All these attributes of God. And when we realize those things, then we come to a place when we say, God, you're better than we are, and we bow down. And an important part of worship is bowing and saying, God, you are lifted up, and therefore I am bowed down. I, they, they've got songs about bowing to worship, and they all stand up and do this thing. You know, and I just think, my goodness, you're not bowing down. Bowing is prostrate. Bowing's on on your face. Literally, it's in a place of, uh, it, of a, even appropriate fear of holy God in heaven is it's completely, entirely the opposite. And so uh, I say this to, because this is really in our text how important it is that we not see worship and see the body as being what we desire in our flesh, but rather instead really answer the important question of what does God desire? And the Apostle Paul said that this church, when they would come together, they would come together not for the better, but for the worse. Literally, after they had taken of the Lord's Supper, after they had exercised all their spiritual gifts in the church, things were worse off beforehand than they were before they met. I hope that this evening, that we trust that after we leave the place of worship, that we'll be better for it, rather than worse for it. And one of the reasons that Paul mentioned is this matter of spiritual gifts and the abuse of them. Now, if you notice when I read this evening, I did emphasize the word one, and last week we emphasized the word many. Uh, there's one God, there's one Spirit, one Lord, one Christ, one God, one body. But there are many members. And the idea that we are going to see this evening, uh, last time uh, that we met, we really emphasized the importance of unity in spiritual gifts, the importance of have understanding that our spiritual gift is not for our own edification, but it is for the unifying and bringing together of the body. 
And particularly, this portion of Scripture, keep in mind, is speaking of worship collectively of the church when it comes together. This is not talking about individuals and what they do in private in their homes. This is not talking about, you know, your time with God when you get in your closet and you worship God. No, this is very plainly speaking about um, the, the um, time that the church gets together. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, Paul says, I wouldn't have you be ignorant. So we saw a few things last week very, very plainly. We saw that the manifestation in verse 7 of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. And that word with all is one that, you know, some people think, well, it's, the spiritual gifts are given to every man to profit, you know, in every way that he can. No, that's not what with all means. With all is the bringing together, some pharaoh. Uh, it is the profiting for the entire body. And one of the things that is important for us to remember, Christian, is that God does not gift us spiritually for our personal edification. This passage of Scripture is not talking about personal worship. It's not talking about personal edification. It's talking about the body. It's talking about the members being together in the body. And so the purpose of the spiritual gifts, understand when God's Holy Spirit has gifted you for something supernatural that you were not capable of without the Spirit of God gifting you, the purpose of it is for the entire body. See, that's verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. And the idea with all is, is given to each one to profit everyone. One of the distractions of the church at Corinth was that that was not the focus of spiritual gifts. The focus for spiritual gifts was not how is this going to build up the entire body. Okay, so we're going to finish that particular thought this evening. And uh, I just want to look at a few things. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my eyes. But I want to look at a couple of things this evening. Uh, it's appropriate to have trouble with my eyes because it illustrates actually what's in our text this evening, and so I think the Lord gave me that as a special gift this <laughs> evening. Um, okay, so last week we saw that we're one body, and um, the we saw emphasis on the word same, one, and ultimately what we saw last week was the importance of unity by diversity. Unity by diversity. We do not have to be the same in order to be unified. There's so much pressure, isn't there, in life to be just like, to have the same. And uh, even in Christian circles, we want to have the same experience. Somebody's had this experience, and it's like, you have that experience? And you just feel like, oh, no, I haven't had that experience. And uh, maybe I'm not as good a Christian, whatever. Well, friend, uh, the whole point of spiritual gifts and the one member having it to profit with all is that we don't have to have the same spiritual gift or the same spiritual experience. One of the things we saw uh, last week that is important it is that it is important that we are what God made us to be. In other words, it's not important that we have the gift that we covet. It's important that we have the gift that God has given us. It's important that we recognize the necessity in the body for us to be what God made us to be. And literally a large portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 illustrates that. Um, we need to learn as believers to find that our value is not in being what we desire, but it is in what we can be made to be for the glory of God. We need to learn as believers to find our value not in being what we desire, but in being able to be for the glory of God. Look down with me, if you will, at verse 12. The Bible says, For as the body is one... And hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. The Bible is very, very plainly emphasizing the fact that even though the body, or it, it's, it's emphasizing that even though we are individuals in the body, that the point of emphasis is the body and not the the one individual. Now, I illustrated last week, I think, how that you can remove a member of the body and it's still a body. In other words, if I were missing an eye, I'd still be me. I wouldn't lose my soul. My soul wouldn't go out in my eye. Uh, or if I, were, if I were missing my legs and my arms, I'd still be me, but I would be limited. I would be hindered by what is missing in my body. You understand this? And a healthy church 
can be, or I mean, sorry, a church can be missing parts of its body, if you will. There could be missing parts. And if you are a believer, you're supposed to be part of a body. Does that make sense? You don't find anywhere in the scripture where the Bible would teach, well, you know what, you don't need to be part of a body. And if you're not part of a body, there's a body somewhere that's missing parts. It's kind of a little bit creepy to me to think about, you know. You think about an eyeball wandering around by itself. You know, talk about if the whole body were an eye. And I, does anybody else envision the whole body being an eye, if you will? And I'm just thinking, how would the eye get around? You know, it does have some muscle in it, so maybe it can flex its muscle and roll. But my goodness, I wouldn't want to have to roll around and get my eye all dirty. I want an eyelid for my eye, you know. If the whole body were an eye, I love that. You know, the whole body were a hand, you know, so you got... The hamburger helper, you know, walking around, you know, <laughs> or, or whatever. Well, um, it's not very functional, you see. And the truth of the matter is that when we think that we have to have encompassing spiritual gifts, we see ourselves as an entire body, or we see ourselves as an independent body, just wandering, member, wandering around as though it's the whole body. And Christian, we must not lose the emphasis of the importance here of the fact that God made us as members to be part of a body, and the importance of being part of the body is so that the body can have unity. So the body can be one. We'll see some things the Scripture says about that. Look down to verse uh, 25, if you will. Let's see. Let's read verse 24 first. The Bible says, For the comely, our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. In verse 25, the Bible says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Now we're going to see here that it is important that the body cares one for another. So many times, isn't it very difficult to feel as though nobody cares? Every one of us could relate to the nobody cares about me syndrome. Isn't that true? At some time, you ever have a day when you just think, you know what, I've got my problems, and it's a good thing they're given to me because nobody else cares about my problems. I'm the only one that cares. You know, or there's maybe even a church problem. And in the whole entire church, the only person that cares is me, and I'm the only one, syndrome, and I'm the only one that cares, syndrome. Well, Christian, it is important for us to realize that if that is true of the body, the body is not what it's supposed to be. But that it is not our focus as individuals to be the one that says, nobody cares about me. Or somebody, what if everybody in the church felt as though they were the one that the entire body ought to be focusing on and caring about. Like all the time. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, how in the world would anyone have time to minister to anyone else when they themselves need ministered to constantly, continually? And this portion of Scripture points out that there are individuals that are needy in the body. In other words, the Bible says in verse 26, whether one member suffer... All the members suffer with it. Now, I can understand this. Right now, my eyes are bothering me, and it bothers my eyelids. It gives me a headache and you know, everything. You know, it's like you, it's distracting. It's, it's, it's amazing how one little thing can affect everything. <coughs> and it's impossible for me to have a serious pain in one portion of my body and for the rest of my body not to be affected by it. Now, I have found it's helpful sometimes to be distracted away from something. Sometimes something else... Uh, this, this year, um, when I got when I got hurt, Charlie and I got hurt in our accident, and my knee got all messed up. One of the things uh, that was neat about how bad my knee was bothering me was that my ankle scarcely bothered me at all, even though it was messed up. In other words, one pain can overcome to where the distraction is you don't notice the pain of the other part, but it's impossible uh, for one part of the body. You know, it'd be, it would have been great if I could have said, "Well, that's just my knee." You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not important. It's just one part. I've got two of them. You know, so I'm going to function as though there's nothing wrong. And boy, I functioned as much as I could, but that knee held me back. It kept me from doing things. I mean, I'm on the ladder, and it's swelling up. It's hurting, and then the next day and that night, it's just screaming out, keeping me from sleeping, makes, my, makes the rest of my body have a temperature. It gives me a fever, makes me sweat. I mean... One little thing, just a knee. I mean, it's just one part of my body. And yet affects the rest of my body. 
You know, you can have a toe. I mean, toes, goodness. Toes are the most sensitive thing in the world. And uh, part of being married is toe pain, I think. It's part of, it's part of marriage. You guys know what I'm talking about. Every, every man here knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, um, walking furniture. You know, furniture that moves itself. I put wheels on one of our couches, and my wife absolutely loves that thing. She can just, she can move it in seconds. I mean, that thing, but um, any I don't know if, if anyone else knows anyone like this, but um, for us, if we need to clean the house and everything looks pretty good, I'm like, oh, just touch things up. No, if we're going to clean the house, everything's going to come away from the walls, and all the corners have to be swept, the floor has to be steamed, mopped, all that thing, the whole place, you know, and then when you put it back, it's all going to try something different this time. Maybe it'll work better this time, moving this couch and this one, this chair and this way. And it's always being moved. And because of that, at nighttime, when you're blind like I am anyway, and when you're moving, um, and you're moving, you know, from room to room, your, your toes are the members of the body that are responsible for locating from or things that are different. Sometimes she moves doorways somehow when I, <laughs> when I slam it into the wall, you know, and I don't know how that happens. Anyway, you can't tell. They're not entirely it's lame in one place. The toes are a sensitive part of the body, and it's, it's amazing how much a, a sore toe can affect you. Try going running when, you, when you've got a messed up toe, broken toe. Try running on it. Um, try just doing anything gracefully with a messed up toe. I mean, it's automatically gives you gangster walk, you know, just because, <laughs> because of the toe. And it's, it's amazing how a little thing affects the body. And that's exactly what the scripture saying. It says, when, in, a, in a body that has unified and that everybody is what they need to be, when there's one member that is, when it's not what it's supposed to be, when there's one member that's suffering, the entire body suffers. You cannot love someone and not suffer at times. When you sign on to love a person, you've signed on to suffer. That's a fact, because it is certain that in the life of every individual there will be suffering. Um, if one member of the Bible says, be honored, all the members rejoice with it. One member is doing well, they're all doing well. Now Christian, I just want to practically point out something here. If one member suffers and the rest suffer, what if one member is missing? How does that affect the rest? You would be amazed. I, I think I probably realize this more than anyone, but perhaps as much as anyone, if not more. You'd be amazed how much it matters when you're here or when you're not. You'd just be amazed. you think, Pastor, I don't matter. Nobody cares. I'm telling you something. When you're not here, it makes a difference. It's like missing a toe. Now, maybe the, you know, the crooked toe, but it's like, it's like missing a toe, um, or it's like missing an eye, or it's like missing a hand. It's just amazing. Um, anybody notice Alex isn't here tonight? Is there just something missing here this evening with Alex not here? I, I mean, I get, you know, I just like, man, I wish he'd get through this whole, you know, relationship thing quickly and get to where, you know, um, you know, we don't have to, it hurts. To have him miss services. And you know, it's like, happens all the time. And uh, you know, it's just, a, it's suffering for the rest of the body because he's not here. And you know something, when Alex got engaged, you know, that um, I think we're rejoicing with him. You just thought, man, praise the Lord. Alex found a sweet girl. And so if one, one is honored, if you will, or has something good happen, then you feel it. And that's the way it is in a body, in a healthy body. Now, I think that there, I want to be careful in saying this this evening, but I think by way of application this evening, I think that a mega church cannot perform those functions in a, in a biblical context. Do you understand what I'm saying this evening? I don't think God's plan is ever for there to be 30,000 people that don't know each other in a ministry. I mean, when the toe hurts, at least know the toe, you know, at least feel the pain. You can't feel the pain if you don't know the toe. I mean, you know, some of us, we just naturally just, because of our experiences, we feel everything. You hear a story and you're like, oh, you know, you just feel because you've gone through what that person's gone through. You know, 
this is funny. This accident Charlie and I had, it's, 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 I, I was traumatized by it. I never realized uh, what trauma was, the way it was. But the first time that I went under a bridge in a boat, I'm serious, I'm not even kidding about this. First time I went under a bridge in a boat, I had anxiety. I felt anxiety. You know, anxious parent, you know me, Mr. Anxiety, Mr. Anxious. Always upset and worried about things. I'm serious. I'm like, it was, it was traumatic to me. And I felt like I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And I just, I don't understand what it'd be like to be one of our servicemen that have to go into combat or uh, somebody that's been through a traumatic experience. But man, I'll tell you, that is no fun. And when I hear about somebody going through something traumatic, it's a little different for me now than it used to be. Just because, man, I, I you know, I didn't, I wasn't upset when they, when we got hurt. It didn't bother me at all. I was just trying to deal with it and get to church. But afterward, I realized that was a major event in my life. I was having flashbacks. You know, I was like, wow, that's, a, that's amazing. And you realize some of these things. And Christian... The same needs to be true as of a believer. We ought to be interconnected enough that we feel when somebody's traumatized or somebody's hurt in the ministry. One of the worst things that could ever happen would be for someone to go through pain and nobody to care. Now, there's a difference between you thinking nobody cares and um, you actually having no one that cares. There is a difference. But Christian, I found that the people who think nobody cares are the most unfeeling about what other people care about. The same person that is so upset about nobody feels what's going on with me is usually the person that really doesn't care about what's going on with someone else. And we as believers need to be very conscious that a unified body feels suffering when someone suffers. And when somebody is honored, feels honored. When something good happens. Jealousy ought never to belong. It's amazing when something very good happens, how people can be just jealous or begrudge somebody of something that God's done that's good. Okay. Um, now look at verse 27. The Bible just ties it all in. And I just want to finish the kind of last week's message. We're about done. Now the Bible says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Does everybody understand what the body of Christ is? It's, it is a body that's comprised with members in particular. Particular means individual. The health of an active body depends on the health of individuals. Did you get this? Now, we talked about suffering. But you know, there is, there is a duty of members to be healthy on the behalf of the body. I've met Christians who don't care about their spiritual health. And they haphazardly, in a very cavalier way, are unconcerned. They say, it's just me. The, you know what? I know it's not right. I know I should live differently. I know I should. I know I should serve the Lord, but it's just me. You know, when you don't serve the Lord, there are things that are undone in the body. When you don't serve in the body, there are things that are undone, and somebody else has to do it. And to a certain degree, man, the whole can make up the lack but friend, when there's a lot of lack, what happens is there's a lot that just goes undone. And there's just a lot that just doesn't please God. And it begins when individuals undervalue the importance of their spiritual gift in the body. They undervalue the importance. And you know, a lot of times it comes because it's like, well, they don't value my gift enough. You know, many times... I've had people tell me this is my gift, and the problem is, is I've already got a dozen of them. When you got a church of 15, a dozen of one gift is not particularly helpful to have another. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Everybody wants to do this. I want to serve. This is my gift. Well, that's great. But the thing is, is that either God doesn't understand the needs of this local ministry, or you undervalue what your needed gift is more than you should. So, I want to see something here. I want to look at something here that helps us to understand this value. Look at verse 22. The Bible says, Nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Friend, 
the feeble members of the body. And the idea of feeble isn't just carrying the weaknesses. The idea is it's just less honorable. One of the things you understand is that without them, boy, it makes a big difference. And they're what we really need. You know, on Sunday morning, it's important to have the preacher. And Wednesday night, it really is important to have the preacher. And some people can perform the job as well or better sometimes. But you know, you need the preacher to be in his place. You really do, don't you? Um, it's unhealthy for a church to have a preacher that's always off and away somewhere doing something else, focused on something else. You need the preacher. You know how many of those you need during the worship service? One. Two is too many. Can't listen to more than one at a time. Can't hear more than one at a time. And the preacher in the body is probably not the unnoticed, if you will, feeble. Do you know what the Bible says about the person who sits in the seat? It says that they are more necessary. It says those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are more necessary. You know the old joke about the man that woke up on Sunday morning and didn't want to go to church? And his wife told him he had to. Everybody's heard that a dozen times. It's like a recycled joke from the Middle Ages. But uh, the man woke up in the morning, didn't want to go to church. And his wife said, oh, you got to go to church. And he said, I don't want to go to church. He said, well, it doesn't matter if you want to go to church, you have to. And he said, well, he said, give me one good reason why I ought to go to church. And his wife said, well, you're the pastor. And everybody can kind of relate to that because how oh, oh, a young pastor ought to go to church. Um, have I ever had a Sunday morning that I found out that I, could, I did have one in our church Sunday morning when I couldn't go to church? I did in Delray, but it seemed like one time it happened here. And uh, you know what? They make it. Make it through Sunday morning. It happens. It works all right. But you don't got to hear every time I miss a service. Things aren't the same if you're not here. Well, that's understandable. But you know the Bible says that things are worse if you're not here than if the preacher isn't here? If verse uh, 22 is to be taken literally, and I believe it is, what it indicates is that those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And the idea is that we understand the necessary ones, but oftentimes we don't understand the feeble ones. We understand things that we think, well, we have to have that. But yet we overlook. Chris, when's the last time that you thought about missing service as though you were the pastor? I have thought about, for sake of illustration, not showing up to church sometime. I honestly have. I thought, well, that would be a neat illustration if I didn't show up to church sometime. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody, didn't notify anybody, but just didn't show up. And then I thought of the consequences of that. I thought, well, I'd probably get fired. Um, they probably send, they probably would, like, file a missing persons report. <laughs> um, you know, I'd probably get arrested. I mean, I just got thinking, you know, what would happen if I just didn't show up for church? You know, it's like one of those nightmares preachers have. You know, you wake up in the morning, you can't remember what day it is, and you think, oh. It's Sunday, and it's after I should have gone to Miami <laughs> or whatever, you know, and you realize, oh, I miss church. Kind of like, you know, after you graduated college, you have that dream that you forgot to go to a class for an entire semester, and you ended up not graduating because you never showed up to class. Maybe you guys never did that. These are weird dreams I have. These are traumatic. What's that? I have that dream. Yeah. College students do for some reason. They, dream, they wake up in the middle of the semester, and they remember a class, and I think, did I go to that class? Oh, no, I was supposed to go to that class this entire semester, and I never did. <laughs> I'm not going to graduate. <laughs> this is a real bummer. Um, okay, okay, so I, I'm being a little bit silly, but I want us to understand this morning that it would be good, wouldn't it, if every person thought, well, if the feeble members are as necessary as the ones that are more prominent or more, you know, quote-unquote, honorable, how big of a deal it is, is it if something causes me to miss being part of that worship service? being my part in the body. Um, you know, this is this is one of the things that I believe very, very, um, with, with deep conviction, I think is very important in the congregational worship. I think that it, it is dangerous in a church for individuals to not participate in the worship service, the singing part of the worship service. I don't think it's healthy. Uh, Pastor, why is that? Well, because... 
you're supposed to worship the Lord. And if you're not worshiping the Lord, you're actually taking away from the collective body of worship. You're actually taking something that we owe God. We owe it to God to worship Him when we gather. And if you won't, if you won't participate in the worship, you've taken away something that all of us are offering to God and you've affected everybody in doing so. Isn't it amazing what it's like to come in a church where everybody sings? Isn't it amazing how much easier it is for everybody to sing when everybody does? It's like, well, you know what? I mean, listen, if, if uh, Brother Taj sings, anybody can sing, right? Um, I was going to say someone else. But, um, all right, if Anthony sings, anyone can sing. Okay, if, if Pastor sings, anyone can sing. If whatever, if this person, you know, it's great to have somebody that does that. You know how important it is for somebody that can't sing to sing? I'm serious. You ever ask yourself the question, how important it is it for me with my frog uh, frog vocals, or whatever you want to call them, my croaker vocals, how important it is for me to belt it out my worship to Lord Jesus Christ? You know it's much more important, far more important for you than for the person who's gifted? You ever think about that? The gifted person sings. The person who's not gifted in singing thinks, well, you know, maybe they're gifted. The person who's not gifted sings. Everybody's like, well, if they can, so can I. And you know what that does to a service? Christian, how important is it for somebody that has bad health to do their utmost to be in the worship service? Ever think about that? I mean, it's easy for them to say, well, pastor has robust health. He never misses. He's always there. What about the person that it was the labor of a couple of days, literally, to get themselves ready to make it to the church house. Pastor McClure used to tell about a man, Rachel Moody, that uh, was in, in their church, and he was dying of cancer. And a few times, they would be going on church soul winning, and Rachel would be the only one to show up. The pastor would say, you know, I'm really glad you showed up, Rachel. He said, yeah, I just feel bad for the poor folks that couldn't make it. You just think, this guy's dying. He's physically dying. The only thing he's done today is made it to church visitation, go soul winning. He feels badly for the poor folks that are so hard off they can't make it. A guy like that would make me want to make it. You know what I'm talking about? Now let me ask you a question. What's the bigger encouragement on soul winning, the guy that's dying of cancer making it or pastor making it? It's a good question, isn't it? It's an important thought, isn't it? See, everybody expects pastor to make it. He's pastor. He has to be there. He has to do that. That's what he has to do. And he has robust health. It's easy for him. Everything's easy for pastor. What about the guy dying of cancer? I made it. And Christian, I would submit to you that the more feeble you are and the more difficult it is for you to perform your part in being part of the body, that the more important it actually it is. And the more effect it has, and the more practically it carries out in worship. Do you see? Do we, have, we, have, we, have we communicated that? So many times, don't we just think the opposite, and aren't we just so wrong? Okay, let's, let's finish out then. The Bible says the reason for it, verse 25, is that there be no schism in the body, no separation, no division, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Okay, now, there's not to be ranking in importance in the church. <clears throat> Do you seek to befriend those who would feel as though they are not part of the inner circle? Do you? Do you conscientiously seek to befriend those? I know so many people say, well, you know, I just, and I just don't feel like I have anybody I can relate to in the church. There's just nobody like me. So you're very unique. Praise the Lord. What does that have to do with anything? Do you seek to befriend those who would feel as though they're an outsider in the church? Somebody who's not like you. Isn't it sometimes almost contradictory of facts to try to find something in common with someone? The truth of the matter is, is that as believers, 
but we ought to look at what the Bible says and not focus on finding something in common, but rather instead finding somebody who needs to be part and, and reaching them, reaching out to them. I would love for everybody to be in the inner circle. You know what I'm talking about? You sit down and they feel, I like it when somebody feels comfortable walking up, sitting down next to me and just talking. I think it's great. Somebody does that, I think, you know what, they feel comfortable. They feel like they're in the inner circle. Like, it matters. But I, I've watched in our church, I've watched uh, folks that come for a long time, and there are particular people on Sunday mornings that either my wife or myself are the primary ones that have contact with them. Nobody else knows them, really. Sometimes I have to describe somebody, and, and they like, I don't remember them. I just don't think, well, they're there almost every Sunday. But you don't know them. You don't know who they are. Why? Well, because we've got something wrong here. We fellowship on the basis of commonality, having something in common rather than on the basis of someone else's importance and need in the church. And the fact is if the less honorable members are the necessary ones, how ought we to esteem them? It's not about us. And believer, we've a mature church is one that comes to the place when they recognize it is not about me. It is about my brother. It is about my sister. It is about their need, not mine. Now, the Bible says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church. First, apostles. Okay, where did the um, what was, where were the first group that were in the church? We've been studying this in Acts in our church in Miami Beach. The thing we saw was when Jesus declared, he said, you know, you're Peter, and on this rock, the rock pertaining to me, the rock of myself, I'll build my church. And when the, the disciples were at Jerusalem, the apostles were with Jesus. Um, they asked Jesus, will thou restore at this time again the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus told him it wasn't a time and that they were going to receive power. The church at that stage, at that phase, was the apostles. God set first the apostles, started the church with the apostles, the apostolic gifts. Acts chapter 1 describes the apostle, the apostle person who was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ before and after his resurrection. Those were the qualifications. And there were at least 13 of them, minus Judas, not counting Judas, in the New Testament. Now, God has set some in the church first, apostles. Then the Bible says, secondarily, prophets. Um, what happened at Pentecost? Fortunately, that isn't what happened, Mike. <laughs> but <laughs> what happened at Pentecost? The Spirit came down. The Spirit came Amen. down, and what happened? People got saved. They said it was fulfillment of Joel. Your young men shall prophesy, and your, old men shall, uh, your young men shall see... Old men shall see visions, and your young men shall dream dreams. I, I've got that turned around. I've misquoted it. But it's Joel. Okay, go to Joel. Prophets. is the prophecy part. The Bible says, second or thirdly, teachers. This is what began to happen afterward in the church and began to set up these gifts. We saw on Sunday evening as we're studying in Titus how that the Apostle Paul had left Titus in Crete, and he said, I want you to ordain elders in every city. Or set up teachers in the church. After that, miracles. Um, different times, different periods, and I believe even today that there are those gifts of miracles in the church. Gifts of healings. Gifts of healings. Okay, so certain gift, maybe a person would have the gift of having the key, um, knowing what the will of God is with regard to healing in the church. God heals. He's able to heal today. I know people that have been healed. They always die afterward, but I know people that heal, are healed today. I'm not being sarcastic when I say they die afterward. Everybody's died so far, except for Elijah and, um, uh, and Enoch. Now here's the question. Are all apostles? Yes. Thirteen of them are. Thirteen of them are. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? 
you all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The Apostle Paul said, you covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And we're going to see that excellent way next week. Are you thankful for your spiritual gift? Do you know what your spiritual gift is? I think that many times... Many times, someone else's spiritual gift is coveted in the place of the one that is given. I don't know about you, but I need my foot. And if my foot got a hankering to be a hand, I'd need that like I'd need another foot. You know what I'm talking about? I need my eyes. And if my eyes wished that they were feet, that would cause me some real consternation. I need my liver. I need my stomach. Maybe not more of it, but I need it. <laughs> I need what I have. If one part of it starts to get this wild hair that says, I don't want to be what I am. I want to be what this is over here. If probably overvalued something that's probably less valuable, and you've undervalued what God has made you to be. And really, Christian, what God values ought to be what we value. What God wants ought to be what we want. And this is the first thing as we introduce ourselves to this matter of spiritual gifts in the church and the things that were happening at Corinth that caused it to be said that when they came together, they were worse off than when they came together. And the first one we find is a lack of unity. Everybody wanted the same gift. Everybody coveted a gift that they thought was the best gift. And they had a church that was entirely imbalanced that did not value that which was important and did not value what God valued. We've got to be careful about that, don't we? It would be a tragedy if after being in the place of worship that would be worse than if we'd never been there. Don't we usually think what's well, always better that you're there and that you're not. You know, it's possible that things could be so bad that it would be better that you're not there than that you are. Okay, unless we run with that this evening and say, well, then I'm just not going to come because I don't I think it's bad. Friend, how well off is a person who isn't there? They're a hand walking around by themselves. They're an eyeball rolling around without a body. And it just doesn't work. We need to do things God's way. Father, help us tonight. We pray to learn these things that you've taught us and apply them to the sink into our minds and help us to value what you do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll take a prayer request.